CC uh, PP as uh, idea and scope and it's centered in Abu Dhabi. And one of the reason of the center was to try to increase the collaboration between Abu Dhabi and New York. So when we set it up, we had a very generous uh, travel budget to attract colleagues from New York. And then of course we started and then COVID kicked in like three months after. So we haven't had the possibility to use these funds, but we hope now the situation will normalize. And so you're all invited to either write to me or other colleagues you have uh, in, in Abu Dhabi and uh, come over, visit us. And we have, as I say, uh, funds to cover your stay in Abu Dhabi. So please uh, just drop me a line if you're interested to know more. Okay. So the title of my talk is, do we need to go beyond cold dark matter? So let me give you a bit of a why I'm asking this question. Okay, that's a nice picture of the how it failed. And in the past 20 something years, we have been able to create a very nice description of our universe. So we know its components and we know that roughly four fifths, so 80% of the whole matter content is in dark matter. So I'm not gonna bother you with the why we know about that. I think you're aware about rotation curves cosmic array background and so far so on. And the leading model for dark matter, it's quite simple. It's called cold dark matter and it's based on three properties of this new substance. It's cold, so it has negligible thermal velocity of decoupling. So most of the velocity, all the velocity are simply due by the gravitational collapse. It only interacts via gravitation with ordinary matter, so it's dark. And there is practically no cross section for scattering, so it's collisions. And in this model, we can trace the formation of structure in the universe very easily through numerical simulation or linear theory, post-linear theory. What I do is mainly numerical simulation. So I'm gonna show you how structure formation proceeds in a universe dominated by cold dark matter. It's a bottom-up creation. So you have the creation of small objects first, and then the small objects that will merge with larger ones in order to create what we call a dark matter here. And then here at the center of a dark matter halo, it's where the galaxy will sit. In this specific dark matter halo, this is roughly 200 moving kiloparsec. So this is the size of a typical dark matter halo of a galaxy like the Milky Way. Okay, the Milky Way would live here in the brightest part of the dark matter halo. And this model is great, but if you are interested in models that go beyond cold dark matter, you will find that all papers, they start with the following couple of sentences. Right? They say that colder matter is very successful on large scales. And then here you have a plethora of citation. You have Planck, you have large scale structures, Lewin, or whatever. But then there is always a but. And the but is that the colder matter faces many challenges of small scales. And even today, after 20 years from the presentation, when I first discovered those challenges, I see many, many papers and many talks that start with these two sentences. And what are those challenges? Well, those challenges, there are there's plenty of them. And you might have heard some of them, maybe not all of them. There's the missing satellite problem, the diversity of rotation curves, the too big to fail problem, the cast core dilemma, more recently, galaxies without that one. And then usually the authors of those papers, what they say is that this requires to go beyond cold dark matter. So they try to argue that there is an observational motivated uh, data, motivated uh, push to go beyond cold dark matter. And then depending on the paper, they try to introduce a new particle, a new interaction, a new field, some cross section, time variable, all those things and so far so on. And the question I'd like to address is that, is it really true? Do we need to go beyond cold dark matter because data are telling us to do so or because we are not happy with cold dark matter? So if you're pushed to go beyond cold dark matter, it's because you are not happy, because you think there is a better model, that's great. That's wonderful. And I'm always happy to explore new things. I myself working on fuzzy dark matter and other um, kind of dark matter. But the question I want to try to answer is that, are the data telling us we need to move beyond cold dark matter or not? So are those problems real? And now there's this plethora of problems, but I try to convince you there is practically only one problem that has many faces. And the problem, in my opinion, is very simple to understand for anybody who uh, is a physicist somehow. And all the CDM issues, they come from a single fact. And this fact is that dark matter halos are self-simple. Or if you prefer, there is no specific scaling gravity. Okay? 
What does it mean, all dark matter or self signal? It means the following. If I show you this picture, that's a map, density map of a dark matter halo, you cannot tell me what you're looking at. If I show you a picture of a galaxy, and if you walk in galaxies, you can immediately tell me, oh, this is a spiral galaxy, an elliptical galaxy, a dwarf galaxy, a galaxy cluster. But if I show you this, even if you're working on dark matter, as I've done for the past almost 20 years, you cannot tell me what it is. This object could be the harbor of a galaxy cluster. So an object which has 10 to the 14 in mass and let's say 1,000 galaxies. Could be the harbor of a group, something with around 10 galaxies. Could be the dark matter halo of the Milky Way. Or could be the dark matter halo of a dwarf galaxy. Okay, you cannot tell me what you're looking at. And the reason is that dark matter halos are self similar. Another way to look at this is that if you look at for how the dark matter is distributed, it's distributed always in the same way, regardless of the mass of the halo. Okay, there is this universal density profile that fits all possible dark matter halos. And usually, uh, as I mean, cosmologists rather prefer to talk about uh, density profile. So this is how the density in log scale is distributed as a function of radius. Or if you try to compare with observation, it's much better to talk about rotation curve. A rotation curve is simply, you have the mass enclosed, you multiply by G, you divide by R, and you get the velocity out of it, square root, okay? So what happens that you can have plenty of different rotation curves for different uh, dark matter halos. You see some of them, they go as high as 200 kilometers per second. Some others, they go down as 20, 30 kilometers per second. But this is because I'm expressing them in radius and circular velocity. But if I rescale the radius to the size of the object, so I divide by the video radius, and I divide the circular velocity by this peak velocity, I can collapse all of them in a single line. And that's exactly the problem of self-similarity, okay? The same happens if you look at, for example, at the number of structures. By looking at this picture, I mean, if you want to count them, there are roughly two, 300 sub -halos. those are the satellites here, they have a mass between 10 to the minus two and 10 to the minus four, the main halo. So if this object was to be 10 to the 14 solar masses, there would be 300 halos between 10 to the minus 12 and 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 10, okay? And this happens regardless. Regardless of the mass of the object, you always have these roughly 300 satellites lurking around. And now, why is this a problem? Well, the problem is very simple. The problem is that galaxies are not self-similar. And that's where everything comes about. If I look at the rotation curve of galaxies, those are four rotation curves of four different galaxies. Those are the points with the arrow bars. This is a nice paper by Oman in 2015. And what he showed is that the rotation curve of galaxies, they come with different shapes. Some of them, they rise very fast and then they flatten. Some of them, they rise very slowly. And others, they are somehow in between. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that if your dark matter model is able to reproduce one of those rotation curves, it cannot reproduce all of them. Because rotation curves, when you look at the dark matter, they all look like the same. So this is the cusp core problem, if you want, there's too few mass in the center or the diversity rotation curve. But practically, the problem is that you have a model which is very stiff. You have a model which no freedom because it's self-signal. And you have data, galaxies rotation curves, they are extremely diverse, okay? And the same happens for the satellites. That sometimes goes as the missing satellite problem. Because I told you that the dark matter halo always have 300 substructures, give or take. But if you go to real objects, galaxies and galaxy cluster, so the one on the left is the Milky Way, mass of 10 to the 12. The one on the right, massive cluster, mass of 10 to the 14 solar masses, they're not self-signal. If I look at the Milky Way, there are roughly 50 satellites around, uh, what is its mirror radius? But if I look at the Abel 1689, I see 700 satellites, each of these galaxies is satellite. Okay, so again, you have a model, this is another problem, right? But this comes from the fact we have a model, model which is self-similar, all that materials look exactly the same, and you try to fit observations which are not self-similar, okay? So if you want to explain all those problems, what you have to find is a way to break the self-similarity. That's it's how you can try to solve the problem of all that matter. And now, how do you do that? Well, two ways. The first way is to break the self-similarity in the dark set. 
So you bring a scale into your problem. For example, you have self-interacting dark matter, you're bringing a cross-section, that's a scale. You could have what is called fuzzy dark matter, that's dark matter which is uh, axions based, extremely light particles, 10 to the minus 20 electron volt. And what happens, they have a De Broglie length, which is of the size of um, astrophysical interest, around kiloparsec. And again, you bring a scale into the problem. Or you can bring some interaction in dark sector. For example, you can have interaction between dark energy and dark matter, those are called couple or couple moments. Or, as I usually say, I mean, you can have, you name it, dark matter, right? There are more models than people working on them when it comes to the dark sector. So you can break the self similarity in the dark sector, and this is an option, or you can think about the elephant in the room. How what is the elephant in the room? It's that we don't observe dark matter, we observe galaxies. So on top of, of structure formation, the dark matter, we have galaxy formation. And then the question you have to ask yourself, can galaxy formation break the self-similarity? And if the answer is yes, you don't need to modify the dark sector. You can, but you don't need. Okay, so how do you study the effect of galaxy formation? That brings me to four slides about the project we are running since many years now, uh, then we were Abu Dhabi, and it's called the Nihao project. Nihao is an acronym, stands for Numerical Investigation of Hundreds of Physical Objects. And it also means hello in Chinese. And that's because this is a collaboration that started between the Max Planck, the Purple Mountain Observatory in China, and now uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. And that's a list, a very partial list of the people working on Nihao. So what is Nihao? The point of Nihao is try to create a statistical significant sample of galaxies. We have our order of more, almost 200 now, where we have at the same time the formation of the dark matter, so the dark sector, and the formation of the actual galaxy. So this is one of our galaxies just being rendered in order to uh, mimic observations. So you have bright colors for younger stars. There is dark matter in this picture. I'm only showing you stars and gas. So you still can get extremely nice, this galaxy, razor thin, these galaxies. And there is a list here of physics we implement. And I'm happy to give more details if needed. So the, good, the point of this exercise is that we can follow at the same time the formation of the dark matter. That's the same movie you showed at the beginning. But then we also follow the collapse of the gas, the cooling of the gas, the injection of star formation, the, uh, uh, the uh, star formation. And so we have stars here and the gas then gets uh, energy from dying stars, supernova. We have supermassive black holes, another energy air source in the system. And now you see, we go from something which is very simple to one, gravity, no scale, to something which is extremely complex. So here we have plenty of scale, right? From the Boltzmann constant, to the cooling time of the gas, to the typical star formation time, the dynamical time of the galaxy. So we're bringing in a plethora of scales that might be the solution to our problems. Okay, uh, that's movie, of course. This is time from the Big Bang, dark matter, gas, blue, cold, red, hot, and this is stars. Okay, again, this is just cosmetics. It's a set of the galaxies we can produce to try to convince you we have nice galaxies. But I want to bring up a problem and problem. I have a thing that I uh, might be interesting, and that it's always uh, to keep in mind when anybody comes to you and talks about galaxy formation, and so that we can do structure formation from first principle. We understand gravity very well, but we cannot simulate galaxies from first principle. And the reason is very simple. For example, I told you we follow the formation of stars. How do we do that? Well, we have a limited number of elements that we can use to uh, make up our galaxy. And usually we have order of one 10 million elements in the gas. And given that the total gas mass, for example, in the Milky Way is something around 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, we arrive to the mass per gas element of roughly 10 to the four solar masses. This means that when we want to do star formation and we use some threshold, at a given point, part of this gas goes in what we call a star, but it's not a star, it's a star particle. So it's a cluster of stars. And then we have the part of this initial gas mass every uh, stays as gas. Then we have the, the massive, the part of the massive stars here in the stellar particle, we have a stellar population. So we have small stars and big stars, we have initial mass function, they die. They produce supernova energy. Energy goes back into my system. And so changes the temperature and density of this gas particle to some new values. And that's how we do feedback. Now, you can understand this is very, very simple. And for example, if you compare this is the forming region, this is Hubble picture 
And what you see here are new stars that just formed. Here is the initial cloud of gas, which is now teared apart by the stars. All this beautiful physics, and there are institutes that just spend all their time studying these kinds of physics, it's encompassed in one single big block for us. Okay? So whenever you try to do galaxy formation, the first thing you have to do is to validate your simulations against observation. In order to do that, what we use was some basic properties. So the first thing we asked is that, can we create galaxies that for a given total mass, they have the right stellar mass? So there is a way, so this is the total mass of the galaxy, this is the stellar mass of the galaxies. And we know using gravitational lensing, the dynamics of satellites, abundance matching, that real galaxies, they should live around this black line. So this black line here is observation motivated. And now we, we found a way, uh, uh, a set of parameters in our simulations that are able to reproduce the right stellar mass for a given halo mass across almost five orders of magnitude in stellar mass. Okay, that's just one set of parameters. So we don't change it. Whether we simulate a massive galaxies or dwarf galaxies, the parameters never change. Okay, so good, we got this relation and then we, we proceed and we try to see uh, what we do for other relations that we didn't use to change. For example, this is called the Tully Fisher relation, it has to do with the, where the velocity curve of the galaxy reaches some flat part for a stellar mass. If you don't care about the details, what I want you to take from this plot is that the red are observations and black is our simulation. And you see, we can get at the same time, the slope of this relation, the zero point and the span. Okay, and we didn't use any of our, we didn't tune any of our parameters for this relation. Then we move from a completely different relation. This relation has to do with stellar mass. This one has to do with gas mass. So we have here the disk size. So how large is the disk versus the amount of cold gas. And you see those two quantities are kind of unrelated to other two. And again, in red, we have Nihao, and in black, we have the observation, and we can get scatter, zero point, and so on. Okay. So I have many more relations to show, but I think it's beyond the point of this talk. What I want you to take away is that we have analyzed our gases a lot in their luminous component, and they do very well. Okay. So now we can use them to try to understand what happens to the dark part. So this is a list of the papers. They are all numbered with Nihao. I think we now we reach Nihao 26. I kind of lost track of that. So now we have observed, sorry, observed and, re and simulated galaxies. Can we break the self-similarity? So I'm going to make this very, very short. The answer is yes. OK. So this is a specific rotation curve of this galaxy here, IC 2574, which is notoriously difficult to get in simulation. And the reason is that. If you look at the density profile from dark matter, you always get this steep rising curve, whatever is green here, okay? Where this blue data, they tend to rise very, very slowly. So these blue data points are the same as the red data points, just analyzed by different people. And here this real from Nihon. So just I highlight two curves here. This one is what I get if I try to simulate with only dark matter, the problem. So similarity, you always get the steep rising curve. It's very hard to get the red point. If I add all my galaxy formation, the line I get is this one. So it's this gray line, which highlight with blue. And you see it goes through the points at the level, which is even suspicious. And the reason is that thanks to Nihau, we have 200 galaxies. So I can try to find one that matches IC uh, 2574. So yes, we can break the self-similarity. And there is a nice way to show this, which is this plot here. In this plot, you have the velocity, rotation velocity in the hydro simulation versus the one in dark matter as a function of the video radius. So what you see that those lines are all on top of each other at very large distance. That's at the video radius. This means that at very large distances, the self-similarity is, uh, is preserved. All the lines are together. It means you still live in a self-similar unit. But what you see is that when you move inside where the galaxy actually is in the dark matter halo, all those lines, they open up. And what it's telling you is that we can create diversity from a self-signal model, okay? So you see some lines are above, some lines are below. That means that you can get more or less mass with respect to the pure dark matter case. The point that they open up. And so we can create diversity from a self-signal model. And just to explain you why this happens, I have this movie. This movie shows the formation of a dwarf galaxy. And what you see here is just the gas. And what you see is that the gas is, I can restart the movie. 
at the beginning is falling in into the uh, galaxy and then you have the first episode of star formation you have supernova explosion and you see the gas is kicked out okay so what's happening here that the dark matter which if it was by itself will see a density potential which is just growing as a bunch of time right gravity is only attractive so it's only piling up matter what happens here is that this gravitational potential is keep changing as a function of time because when gas goes in, it's a deeper potential. When gas goes out, it's a shallower potential. So what you create here, you create a time variable potential. And that's the scale you're introducing into the problem is the time variation, okay? Now you have something which has a specific scale. And now you can easily imagine that this scale that you're bringing into the problem is different from different galaxies, right? If I have a very big galaxy, I'm going to have a lot of star formation at the beginning, less than the end. If I have dwarf galaxies, the star formation is going to change and so far so on. So not only you bring a scale into the problem, which is this change in time and the potential, but this scale is also keep changing from object to object. Okay. So as a consequence, what happens that this continuous, this uh, potential, the, sorry, this density profile, which is usually universal in dark matter, it gets broken up. And one way to quantify it, for example, is to look at the inner slope, which, for example, is important for self annihilation of dark matter. And this slope is just a logarithm slope of the profile. It should be minus one in the universe with only dark matter. But what you get as a function of dark matter is that the red line is what you will get in the universe with only dark matter. And instead, our galaxies, they show a very changing density, in, uh, central density. Okay, so there's no such a thing as universally profile, which again is telling you the sub is broken. And here the points are red and blue, and the red ones are galaxies which are dominated by supernova feedback, and blue ones are galaxies which are massive, so are dominated by AGM feedback. So also the black hole, it's keep pushing the gas in and out and introduce a completely different scale. And that's why you get this sort of wavy behavior. Okay, this is telling you that the scale you're introducing into the problem is changing as a function of dividends. Satellites, missing satellites problem, again, it's solved by default. What happens here, for example, you have here in this plot, there's a function of the number of star, uh, stellar mass, how many satellites you expect. There are two observational lines here. This upper one is the Andromeda galaxies, there's a number of satellites around Andromeda. The bottom line, this black one, is the number of satellites around the Milky Way. And those are four galaxies simulated from Nihai. They all have the same halo mass. But you see that they kind of bracket the observation. Okay, so the number of satellites we get, it's uh, it's the right one. And how this happens? And again, another movie. What happens is that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence in between star formation and structure formation. So structure formation, it's a signal, right? You see that if I if I don't tell you what you're looking at, you can't tell me what it is. But if you go here. Now, what you see is that not every little lump in dark matter is hosting a star. The massive ones, yes, this one is this guy here, this one is this guy there. But for example, this guy coming in doesn't have a stellar counterpart. And again, cell similarity is broken because now if I show you this picture and you tell me, okay, I have a central object of roughly 15 satellites, most likely I'm looking at Milky Way. Okay. And in fact, you can quantify this. And this plot you have as a function of the halo mass, the stellar mass of a satellite. And you have here, this points here, where for, this tells you that, for example, for 10 to the 8 halo mass, you have a satellite 10 to the 6. But you also have all those points down here. And those are satellites that have zero stars inside. And this little line here is the dark fraction. So probably it's telling you that if you go to 10 to the 8, sorry, 10 to the nine in halo mass, what you have is roughly 80% of the satellites are dark. Sorry, Andrea, uh, are, the, are the, like the data points observations or are there somebody's no, modeling? That's just simulation. The only observations are here when we match the total number of satellites. And then you ask yourself, how, how is that I have 200 in dark matter and I only get, for example, here in this case, 15 in stars. And the reason is that most of them are dark. So the dark fraction is very, very high. And that is for a reason, a lot of reasons. There's reionization, there is a supernova feedback that removes all the gas from the satellites and so far so on. The point is that galaxy formation is breaking itself similarity again. So most of the satellites, they are dark.
And for example, this brings me back to my initial plot. So what were you looking at here? Well, this object here has a dark matter mass of 10 to the nine. So this is the object you look at in dark matter. But when you look at it in stars, it's just this little smudge here, okay? All this structure here, which are present in dark matter are completely absent around the stars. And that's the gain the cell similarity, which is gone, okay? So you have here 400 satellites and only one luminous object, okay? This object is very extreme. It has a stellar mass, a dark matter mass of 10 to the minus five. Just to give you an idea for the Milky Way, it's 10 to the minus one. So 10 to the minus two, it's roughly 1%. This object is, is extreme. Andrea, can I ask a question? Of course. Yes, so thank you so much. So one thing that I wanted to um, ask you is what about kind of observational um, uh, 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 kind of incompleteness? So, I mean, so far you've mentioned kind of basically the, the messy astrophysics, right, <laughs> is the culprit, right? Because you mentioned you know, feedback, be it supernova or AGN, or in this case here, um, or earlier you showed that uh, some of them stay dark, they don't make, you know, stars. But what if, you know, there was some discussion, well, what if you're just not finding these uh, dim satellites and then with the ES right in the south, the dark energy survey that also was looking for um, these missing satellites, you know, they're finding them at certain numbers. I was wondering, and I know that's not perhaps your area, but I was wondering, is there also room for kind of observational improvements just in being able to find some of these missing things? Or do you think it's just the kind of, you know, astro, you know, the kind of physical astrophysics, basically, that's... That's um, so, yeah. that's explaining everything. So there is room to find more, but you cannot bring the total number of satellites. For example, here for the for Andromeda, it's right. Or we look at the Milky Way. If you look at the old satellites with the mass larger than ten to the five, we have a ten or eleven. This is an eleven. There is no way to bring this number to hundred, right? Mm -hmm. There is no way. So you can find more. And for example, if you find more, this number maybe goes to fifteen. And then what happens that Instead of comparing with this galaxy, simulated galaxy, you can compare with this other simulated galaxy. So there is a lot of scatter from galaxy to galaxy. For example, if you just compare the Milky Way and Andromeda, which are similar galaxies, Andromeda is roughly twice the number of satellites of the Milky Way. So there is room to find more, but not to find as many as, as you need. So even if you double the number of satellites, that's not a big issue. And there is also some discussion whether the satellites are isotropically distributed. So we tend to look above the disk. But that's where most of the satellites are. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we need to form a galaxy with exactly 10. Any number between 10 to 20 is OK. But if you look in dark matter, you have 300. And you cannot get 300. Mm -hmm. So the incompleteness plays a role to move this black line up and down here. But you see, I can always find a simulated galaxy that looks like that one, because there is enough scatter from galaxy to galaxy. Thanks. Most welcome. Sorry, I have a question. I mean, it's really something that bugs me a little, but maybe it's, it's trivial. The uh, non-scale invariance, I mean, the, the time dependence and the scale introduced by matter is due to a small fraction of the total matter, I mean, less than 20%, because it's done, and a, a, a fraction of that fraction. But still, even if it's a, this tiny amount, you say it's sufficient to change uh, dramatically the properties of dark matter? It does, because what you need to change is the property of dark matter at small scales, so at around 1% of the video radius. So it's true that baryons only account say one fifth and not all of them go into a galaxy and not all of them participate in this uh, scaling, uh, scale breaking process. But you don't have to compare the total amount of dark matter, just the dark matter in the center. For example, if you look at the Milky Way, if you look at the within eight kiloparts of our position from the sun, more than half of the mass, it's in variance. It's not in dark matter. So the Milky Way is dark matter dominated. We, we don't debate about that. But at the solar radius scale, half of the mass is in stars. And that's what happens. That's why I think in that plot, uh, let me see if I can quickly uh, move it. Uh, no, not quickly. So that's why I show this. Oh, there you go. So if you look at this plot, okay, there you go. if you look at this plot, this is a function of the video radius. You see that up to 10% of the video radius, there's no much breaking the cell similarity. All those lines, they do stay together. And that's because here you are strongly dark matter. When you go inside at 1% of the video radius, 
And the Milky Way leaves around a few percent of the beta radius. I mean, the Milky Way in stars. That's where you break the self similarity. So the problem is that you want to break only in the center. And there, you just need a little bit of matter. Thank you. But it's a very fair point. Okay. The, do we have 10 more minutes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You have okay. uh, 25 more minutes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so, what happens is that despite all of that, now and then, there is always new issues brought up to try to kill cold dark matter. And I, I understand why, right? Because if you kill the king, you become famous, right? <laughs> if you protect the king, you don't get anything. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very annoyed by the fact that all those people that tend to put out the, the mother hand, they put out those papers every time they tend to ignore the role of variance. So there's a sort of a need to prove cold dark matter wrong. So I don't know if you followed that, but a couple of years ago, there was this discovery of galaxies without dark matter. And that was a big challenge for galaxy formation. And I want to go through this thing in, few, in the next five minutes. So this is the paper I'm talking about. It's a letter to Nature, and it's from Peter Van Dokkum, and it's a galaxy lacking dark matter. And he published that in 2018, and then uh, I mean, less than a few months later, he uh, found out the second galaxy, which very similar properties to the first one. So what is the issue with this galaxy? And this is a dwarf galaxy. So it has a total stellar mass of 210 to the 8. And what is peculiar of this, oh, what is peculiar? What is nice of this galaxy is it has 10 globular clusters around it. So what one document collaborator did, they look at the velocity along the line of sight of those globular clusters. Since you have 10, you can compute the mean and the dispersion around it. And if you look at the velocity dispersion, it's five to eight kilometers per second. Depends a little bit how you, you have 10 objects. So if you remove or add one, this thing changes a little bit. So, but let's stick with five to eight. And what is very interesting is that this, this 10 global clusters, they have radius up to nine kiloparsecs. okay? That means they are probing a large region of the galaxy. Now, as Zwicky told us, that's almost hundred years ago now, if you have a velocity dispersion and if you have a radius, you can easily compute the dynamical mass, right? It's a bigger theorem. So it's, that's how Zwicky first came up with the Dunkel materia, right? By looking at the velocity dispersion galaxy clusters and found that it was, the mass he got was 300 times what he can observe. So you can get the dynamical mass. And if you do the sigma square RG, what you get the dynamical mass, it's very consistent with the stellar mass. So practically there is no dark matter within this galaxy, at least within nine kiloparsecs. Good. So the first question that you have to ask yourself, is this a challenge? So I can go into my Nihao database, I have 100 galaxies, and I can look, is any of my galaxies able to reproduce this observation? And this is the first fact, and the answer is no, that's quite nice, I think. So here I have plotted the stellar mass of the galaxy. So for, uh, there are two observed galaxies. So I put two single stars. And the reason is that for each galaxy, uh, Van Dokkum gives two different measures of sigma. So you see the stellar mass is the same, but two different measures of sigma. And that depends on the statistics you use to obtain the sigma. So I am considering them as four independent points. And now I can look at the same stellar mass and the velocity dispersion of all my Nihau galaxies. And you see that we, we do have a problem because all my galaxies, they have velocity dispersion at minimum of 25 kilometers per second, very far away from the five to eight, 10 that Van Dokkum is measuring. So it seems that in this, there is a problem. But what is interesting of this galaxy is that this galaxy lives nearby a much more massive galaxy. So that's the galaxy we're talking about. And now if I zoom out, this galaxy is within a few hundred parsec, uh, kiloparsec from a very massive object, NGC 1052. Okay, so the question is that can tidal effects have somehow removed dark matter from this galaxy? And this is, I mean, of course, when Dokkum talks about that, but this is very, very difficult to do because if you just do some calculation, you find that the tidal radius is much larger than the actual uh, stellar radius. So practically, what you want to do in order to remove, to lower the dark matter, you want to remove dark matter from 14 kiloparsec, that's where the stars are. 
Why you want to do that without touching the stops? So somehow what you need, it's a, it's a mechanism that removes dark matter, but doesn't remove stars. Because if you remove both, you don't change the ratio between the two. Okay. So that's where simulations come uh, very in handy. So what we did, we took three galaxies from Mihama, those are the three that are marked here, and we sent them on an orbit around a central object looking like uh, NGC 1050. Okay. So the question is that what happens when you take a small galaxy and you send it near bigger galaxies? Okay, those are the orbits. And so can we reduce the central contact of dark matter without touching the stars? And lo and behold, that's what we got. So this is the velocity dispersion as a function of time. And that's the starting point, which is around 35 for this specific galaxy. And that's how it evolves as a function of time while the galaxy is orbiting. So this kick here, it's this point here when the galaxy is at the closest passage to the central object. And then I follow its evolution on this branch here of the orbit. And now what you see is that while the galaxy is orbiting, its velocity dispersion goes down. And here there are four points. Those are the four measurements from London, which I arbitrarily put at some time, right? I have no idea at which time on the orbit we are observing the galaxy. So just not to put them at the end, I just spread them as a function of time. Okay, so the position of the stop, the velocity dispersion is correct. The position is totally arbitrary. And what you see is that I can easily lower the velocity dispersion of my galaxy so that it goes through the points. Before telling you why, I just want to show you that, of course, this depends on the orbit. So you see there are three galaxies. This galaxy here, it comes back very early because it's slightly more massive, less than a meter, uh, more than a meter friction. And so you see, for example, for this galaxy, which I call G1, the change in velocity. So this is the beginning. The point here is the closest passage when it gets the kick, impulsive kick. So this point here should be somehow neglected. The galaxy is not relaxed there. And then you see this one goes down. And then you see it goes up again. And it goes up again because it's approaching again the central edge. But, oops. If I look at the other galaxies, they have initial kick. And then both G2 and G3, they have velocity dispersion, which are very consistent with the results from from uh, Peter Van Dock. So what happens is that the initial velocity goes down from 25 down to order five to 10. And for example, what you see here is the ratio between dark matter and stars in the inner part where Van Dock made the measurements. And it starts with a ratio almost to 50, but 50 times more dark matter. And then it goes down to a ratio of 10 or even lower than five. Okay, how is that possible? Well, the reason has to do with the orbits of dark matter. So you have the tidal radius. And of course, if you just have to do a spherical cow model, you cannot remove anything which is within the tidal radius, right? You can only move particles outside the tidal radius. And you have a dark matter particle which sits within the tidal radius. And this particle should be shielded. Now, the stellar particles, they all sit within the tidal radius and they move within the optical radius. So they're very confined. Dark matter particles are not. Dark matter particle, which is moving this way, they tend to have what's usually called pretzel orbits, right? Those orbits that look like a pretzel, the typical uh, German bread, you know, which is uh, uh, wrapped. So what happens is that this particle goes in and out the tidal radius in its orbit. And the reason is that dark matter particles, they have orbits which are very extended through the whole tidal radius. They're not confined. So what happens is that this particle is inside, but then at some point in the orbit, it goes outside the tidal radius. And so at this point, it can be removed. And so this particle, which was supposed to come back here, will never come back. So when I go to this time step, my central density is lower. I can remove dark matter particle from the center because I don't remove it from the center. I remove it when a dark matter particle is far away. And so you can decrease easily the dark matter particle, uh, the dark matter mass within the center without touching the stars. And so this is another problem which is solved and gain through a mixture of galaxy formation and uh, galaxy interaction. And so what you have is that if you just look at normal galaxies that just live isolated, they don't have any tidal interaction, clearly you have a velocity spectrum is much higher in the observation. But when you put those galaxies, the yellow, the red, and the lila, onto an orbit, you can easily lower the velocity dispersion from 30, 25, down to the orbit units of 
one dot of time. So let me bring me to my uh, partial conclusion, and then I have two more minutes, and then I'm done. I think I do not see any clear observational evidence that we need to move away from lambda for dark matter. Okay. And this is based to the fact that variants do everything you need. Okay. And this also includes galaxies without dark matter. We can create galaxies without dark matter in a dark matter dominated universe. And I have a thought, I mean, I also have plots about the too big to fail problem and all those other problems, they're all coming from the same uh, reason. You have a self-similar dark matter and you need to break the self-similarity. And now people usually argue, well, but you cannot exactly repeat, uh, reproduce this observation. The velocity dispersion should be eight, you got 11. But I think that all possible discrepancies are an astrophysical problem, not the cosmological. They all steam out the fact that we cannot do galaxy formation from first principle. So yes, it's true. We don't reproduce everything. But all the differences we have, they can be easily accounted by our inability to do galaxy formation from first principles. And so, are we done? It's called the matter, the answer. Miriam, I'll come to your question in a second. Uh, the answer clearly is no, right? So, as of today, there is no indication that we need a wimp like part, okay? Honestly, from the point of view of galaxy formation, any particle which has a mass larger than 5 kV will do perfectly well. So if you're a sterile neutrino fan, it's perfectly fine because from the point of view of galaxy formation, a sterile neutrino with a mass larger than 5 kV does equally well as a GV or TeV particle, okay? So the only way to prove polar matter is correct is to find something which is strictly related to polar matter. For example, to find a way to see those dark caves that I was telling before. And that's where, for example, stellar streams might be handy. Lensing could be useful. But as, as, to, as of today, I don't see there is any proof that we have seen any of those dark caves. So it, it's very sad because polar matter is not wrong, but doesn't imply that is the right model. So we are kind of stuck. We are stuck with the model that can reproduce all the data that we don't understand. And a few days ago, there was a very nice article by Michael Turner, who said there's a huge difference between being able to describe nature and to understand nature. So I think we're good to describe nature at the moment, but we haven't understood nature by far. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was really wonderful. Um, since Miriam had her hand up, why don't we start with that? Yes, thank you. So, okay, thank you so much for uh, such a really great overview about all these different fields. One question I had is when you mentioned, you know, kind of these, you know, special galaxies that people find and say, look, you know, the one that we mentioned, Fandokum, and then you mentioned the, the reason for that, which would be, you know, this various other stripping. Do you have now galaxies in your, mo in your models then that you could say, look, you should, you should observe these? Right. I mean, every good theory, you know, have, makes predictions that you know people go out and then hope to hope to observe. So, can you turn it around? And say, look, you know, in our galaxy simulation, as you said, you know, Nihao twenty five. You know, you're working on this for so long. Do you have any galaxies that uh, that you could predict? Look, you know, if this is a full consistent model, you should go out and observe these and these, you know, various new kind of I think. Um, these, you know, what called dragonfly um, observations of, you know, very low surface galaxies and all those things, you know, that, you know, from te technology wise are, are not able to, are now able to do, you know, you could perhaps, you know, even predict them and then people can go out and find them. So uh, that's a limitation we all have as simulators. We're always chasing observations and we very rarely try to predict stuff. And this is, I'm not sure why this is the case. So for example, for the dragonfly, we wrote several papers explaining how you can form this very, uh, this ultra diffuse galaxies. Uh, we could have predicted them, we didn't. Uh, this galaxies without dark matter, it was there and we didn't put it out. So uh, sometimes I think we are so interested in the main relations that we don't look at the uh, outliers. And uh, it's a good point. And I'm, I'm trying to look if you see anything peculiar and I, I don't have, any good answer to your question. I don't have any good example for the moment. So it's true that as simulators, sometimes we should try to, to change and tell the observers, oh, there could be this specific galaxy. For example, I have a polar ring galaxy, beautiful in my simulation. And I, I saw it and I thought, I don't know, that's not interesting. And then 
I went to a, uh, to a conference and there was a whole section of talks about polar ring galaxies. I said, well, look, I have one, but I didn't know it was interesting. So I think it's a limitation that we should try to overcome. But no, at the moment, I don't have any good prediction. And if we try to predict how many you should see, uh, that becomes very difficult because in Nihao, we have an extremely complicated selection function uh, because we have to select objects in order to simulate them. And we're trying now to assess the probability of each object, but it's not easy. Okay, thanks. That was a great question, Miriam. Uh, Sarah. Yes, great talk. Thank you. And along the same lines, I was curious if you've seen anything from the MADCAST team that are surveying LMC type dwarfs to see how many um, subhalos with stars they could find around them. So how many satellites around dwarfs. So that's more of the, the mass scale of a stellar mass of 10 to the nine. I think you were showing a halo mass of 10 to the nine and how you wouldn't see the substructure for that. But I'm just curious if you have any estimate of how many of those do we really need to observe and find in order for, for it to be helpful of constraining what you have shown today. And also uh, I'm uh, specifically excited about streams around dwarfs too. And if that could actually help constrain some of these lower mass um, results that you're showing. Yeah, um, so the LMC is a very peculiar object because uh, it's very hard to get an LMC-like object in numerical simulations. So the occurrence of this kind of galaxies, it's less than 1%. So I have to simulate 100 Milky Ways in order to get most, I mean, to have a chance to see one LMC. The other issue is that uh, when we go to very dwarf galaxies, we can simulate them, but in the field. Right, and those could be very different from the LMC because the LMC uh, did form in in the nearby the Milky Way, so it was influenced by the Milky Way. So it's very hard I, to. Support. I'm sorry, I actually meant isolated LMC, so just LMC mass dwarfs, so okay. 10, 10 to the nine in stellar mass. Oh, then then we have a plethora of those galaxies, and we there the other issue is that you need a extremely high resolution because the object is small, so you need a extremely high resolution to resolve them. And I don't think that maybe in this case, a cosmological approach is the right one, right? You rather prefer to try to simulate single object, maybe starting from a stellar disk. But we are looking into that. For example, we were looking at the satellites of ultra diffuse galaxies. And those ultra diffuse galaxies, I think that in, no, I think in mass are very similar to the LMC. And we did see that some of them do have satellites, and uh, it's uh, but it's it's very rare. So uh, yes, we can look into that. And if you have any specific um, observational plot you would like me to reproduce, we, we can talk about that. Okay, thank you, Roman. Yes, um, I was wondering. So you mentioned the scatter. Uh, has many sources like, uh, you know, supernova feedback, IGN. You also mentioned reionization. So how, how do these different sources of uh, breaking subsimilarity uh, contribute as a function of uh, galaxy mass? So I think that broadly we have a, quite a good understanding. So the smaller the mass, the most important fact is reionization. Is reionization by raising the temperature of the IGM prevents any gas infall on those small objects. Now, when you move up in halo mass, uh, what is important is supernova feedback. So it's supernova feedback, maybe I can, I can just use this plot here to guide my discussion. So if you, if you look at this plot, this is just the change in the dark matter density. And it, it, the, the red line is the case with no galaxy formation. And you see that the very small masses, 10 to the 10, you have very little change in the subsimilarity. And the reason is that those galaxies are so strongly dark matter dominated, this goes back to the question from Massimo, that the effect of variance is negligible even in the center. Because there's so few stars and so few gas moving around, nothing changes. Now, if you go up in halo mass, what happens is that efficiency of galaxy formation goes up, and so you have more and more stars per unit of dark matter. And so you hit here a sweet spot where you have the maximum effect. That's where the difference between what we see and this prediction from cold dark matter is the largest. And now what you see is this declining, and this is interesting because what's happening here is that 
Now, when you try to move gas around, you have to fight not only the potential of the dark matter, but also the potential of the stars. Now, now you're forming so many stars in the center that the stars themselves, which are collisionless from the point of view of the simulation, are acting as dark matter. So now you go back to something that looks like full dark matter. So here it's realization for a little bit to make it them dark. Here is supernova. Here supernova are kind of failing. And then what you see that you go to a, a regime where you have actually a sort of compression of the dark matter in the center. So you get the half is minus two. So you get more dark matter than what you have in full dark matter. And then again, and then you see that this curve is going up again. And that's because at this kind of mass, few 10 to the 12, it's where black holes become very important. And here, what happens is that now the black hole is so energetic and is pushing away so much gas that can again change the potential. So to answer your question broadly, it's a realization on the low masses, supernova at intermediate mass, 10 to 11. 10 to the 12, somehow those effects cancel out and you go back to cold dark matter. And then at more massive, you have a growth again due to AGM. So realization, supernova, AGM. That's very broad, of course. As you see, there's a huge scatter from object to object. And what are you assuming for reionization? So it's fixed in your, 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 your simulations, I assume. We have a background which uh, kicks in at redshift 10. But I, I, I need to look it up. And then increases. So it's, uh, it's a la Arte Madao. We don't use Arte Madao. We use, we use um, uh, Fishiguya. But it's the kind of thing that ramps up as a function of time. OK, thanks. And it's global, so it's not local. Well, I don't see another hand, so I'll uh, ask a question. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions. And I'd love to save a little time for you to show us a few slides on the other problems, just so we understand how you would resolve it. Um, one, the, the question is, uh, in fuzzy dark matter, um, the sort of important recent paper of uh, who Hui, Tremaine, Ostreicher, and Witten argued that it should still be taken seriously in spite of some people saying that the um, structure that's seen in Lyman alpha clouds is a sign that you can't have fuzzy dark matter because it would have been washed out too much. And those authors argued that those Lyman alpha constraints shouldn't be worried about it too much because they said the whole Patchy, patchy reionization and so on needed to be simulated properly. Is that something you can implement in your, your work or is that something that just has to be done separately? Does so, that question make sense? Uh, oh yeah, of course. So there are two kinds of answers. The first one, if you try to, I mean, we did implement fuzzy dark matter. We, now we have the code is able to do fuzzy dark matter and it's do it in the proper way. So also taking into account the quantum potential. So the fact that you have an extra force, if you wish. And that can be done. Now, when it comes to the Lyman Alpha Forest, I know there are different school of thoughts. There is a patch realization. There's a lot of assumptions that go into the Lyman Alpha. I think my point of view is the following. If you want fuzzy dark matter, it's fine. And I think it's a very nice model. I'm working on it. But you should pay attention not to overcorrect. Because if you try to solve all the problem with fuzzy dark matter, you still have to put on top of the effect of variance. Mm -hmm. So if you have a model of fuzzy dark matter that somehow, for example, gives you the right amount of sunlights, so you see 10 and you get 10 in dark matter, this is dangerous because of those 10 in dark matter, no, not all of them will be luminous. So no matter what you do, galaxy formation is empty, right? You might have cold dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, but you cannot escape galaxy formation. So if you have a model that you like, and I do like fuzzy dark matter, you should try not to overcorrect. So that tells you that maybe you don't need to go so extreme in the mass and go in tension with the line of alpha because you could be happy with a slightly uh, higher mass that does not, is not in tension with line of alpha because you can use variance for, what, for, for uh, bridging the gap. Uh, you were asking for other things. For example, this is a plot that for a while was uh, interesting. It's called the uh, radial acceleration relation. And so practically, uh, uh, Stacy McGowan collaborators, they found this relation in red between the acceleration that they measure and 
and the acceleration that is supposed to come from the variance. And they say, well, the red line is the prediction of model. And what is nice here is that if you look at the Nihao galaxies, they go on top of Mount. So those are galaxies that clearly will not be done with Mount and done in colder water, and yet they look like Mount. Hmm. And why this happens? That's a very interesting question. So the first thing is that Nihao can reproduce rotation curves. Everything that is Mount related comes from rotation curves, so no surprise we can reproduce that. And so again, you don't need to go to Mount, you can just use cold dark matter plus galaxy formation. Uh, another thing is the uh, too big to fail problem. This is, uh, this is uh, I just removed the panel here for clarity. This is the radius at, uh, so from five to uh, whatever is this point in um, kiloparsec. And the black points are the velocity dispersion of some of the Milky Way satellites, okay, the most massive ones. Those are, so for, for massive galaxy, your rotation curves. Right? For these satellites, you can only measure the rotation at one point. And what is interesting is that then if you compare with the typical rotation curves of the dark matter satellites that are supposed to host those points, all the dark matter satellites, they're above the points. So you cannot use this dark matter satellite here, right, to fit any of those points. The curve is too high. And that's because there's too much mass in the center. You run me how? You don't aim for that. And what you get is that the total mass in the center is reduced because variants are pushed out. And then suddenly, if you look at these 10 objects, those are rotation curves you get. And you see, they go through the points. So too big to fail, solved. And we are not the first one to say that, right? It's not me how we solve it. This is coming from all, practically all groups at the same time. You put galaxy formation and you don't have this problem anymore. Those lines, they go down. So if you want, lines are theory, points are, Data, you want the lines to go through the points. It doesn't happen if you only have cold dark matter. You put galaxy formation, it happens. And that sounds like a miracle, but it, it's not. It's that you always go in the same direction. You remove mass from the center. That solves most of the problem. Actually, all the problems I'm aware of. Well, a takeaway that, that I think, uh, see if you agree with this, is that to use these observations to test dark matter models is going to require a very much more extensive effort in simulating in order to, because it'll in the end have to be a statistical measure, right? You've shown that you can find examples of each of the different things that's been found. And then in that case, you have to study the statistics of whether the model can be reproducing the statistics. And that's presumably a really major undertaking. Yeah. Um, not to mention, as I told you, that galaxy formation has a lot of parameters in it, right? So once uh, Christoph Vetterich asked me, okay, how many simulations you need in order to nail down the, the astrophysics? And I say, infinite, right? Because at the end, what I have to do is to connect scales down to the parser with the mega parser scale, and there's no computer that can do that. So I think we reach a point where we have a descriptive model for nature, but try to understand it, it's very, very hard. So now I can tell you that any dark matter particle, which has a mass below 5 kV, if it's a thermal candidate, it's overcorrecting. But from 5 kV to up what you want, it's fine, right? I, I'm taking out fuzzy dark matter because I'm talking about more thermal candidate, fuzzy dark matter, so thermal candidate. But practically, I think now we, I start from cosmology. I come from cosmology. I did my PhD thesis in dark energy. Then I, I convinced myself that I need to understand galaxy formation in order to do cosmology. And now I think all the efforts should be in galaxy formation before going back to cosmology. Unfortunately, we wish. Are there any other questions? If not, I'll ask one and let other people have a chance to think. Um, so there's this sigma eight uh, Hubble parameter, maybe tension. And I think there are pretty good arguments, some coming from people at NYU that the Hubble parameter tension isn't necessarily a problem, but there may still be, I think, a sigma eight tension. And I'm curious, that seems after all sigma eight has to do with galaxy formation. Do you see any aspect of your work relating to that question? Uh, 
well, if you want to test sigma eight, you have to go very large scale. So we are talking about instead of doing galaxy formation of single objects, as because we were interested to go to the small scale, it's much okay. better to do large cubes with a lot of galaxies. So that's something that I can easily do, but it's not the focus of my group because we were very interested in the small scale. And there are a lot of groups that are doing that, and uh, from Zurich to uh, France, and they are looking into that. So that's that's a very different question. But yes, you can use simulation to test this. Right, I guess I should, I didn't ask it very precisely. The question would be, when normally thinks that those large scales, the baryonic physics, for example, shouldn't matter, but maybe your, your, your understanding that's evolved would suggest that it could matter even on those scales. Well, it, it depends uh, the precision of your measurement. So for sigma eight, I don't think baryonic physics matters much, but if you want to do Euclid line measurements of the power spectrum, when the precision is below percent, there baryonic physics does matter. So it's it's about the precision of your measurement. And I, I'm sure there are people in the audience that know more than me. But for example, I am a bit worried about Euclid because Euclid is kind of swapping the baryons under the carpet because they are on large scale, which is true, but they're extremely precise. It's like QCD corrections, right? You, you, you don't have to take into consideration unless your measurement is super precise. And then of course you have to do loop corrections. Mm -hmm. And so variants, if you want, they look like this. They are correction, but if you're very precise, they matter. Mm -hmm. All right, go in, go in, go on on the question time. And since uh, Andrea is practically our, our neighbor in some, <laughs> some larger dimension, uh, we can always, Ping him after and have Please. a discussion. Well, thank you again. It was really wonderful, and we sure appreciate you you're doing this for us. Um, next week's seminar is going to be live in person. It'll be Gordon Dame on astrophysical neutrino exotica, you might say, things that you wouldn't have thought of uh, that neutrino masses could imply. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that'll be next Tuesday. And you're, you guys are always welcome to join us, Andrea. We're going to make them um, all as much as we, you know, okay. modulo for getting to do it will be uh, Zoom. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Again.